Okay, I'll go ahead and get started because I mean, we're gonna have, we're, we're I'm gonna make some announcements that people can miss <laughs> in the very beginning. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Whitney Broadway. I'm the uh, director of the Southeast Museum of Photography. Uh, today, we are going to be talking uh, with the curator and several of the artists that are featured in our current exhibition uh, called Threshold, Recontextualizing Self-Portraiture. So we're very excited to have everybody here. We have a very large group of artists uh, here with us today. Um, before we start our chat, uh, I, a few housekeeping things. Please feel free to uh, put any questions you may have in the chat. I will be keeping my eye on it and feeding those uh, to those questions to the artists um, or holding them to the end. And uh, we are planning on trying to leave some time at the end for uh, questions from our attendees. Attendees, if you have tried to unmute yourself or to turn on your camera, you may have noticed that you cannot. Um, we felt that might get confusing with everything going on. So we have limited uh, the uh, microphone usage and video usage to just our presenters today. If you are joining us from somewhere that you are close enough to come visit us in person, first of all, we would love for you to come uh, see the exhibition uh, before it closes this summer. Uh, there are also some events that you should keep your eyes open for. On April 22nd, we are going to be having a hands-on workshop with uh, Jillian, uh, the uh, curator of this exhibition, on how to do cyanotypes. So we'll have some more information posted and how to uh, sign up for that once we have a little bit more details ironed out on that. Then on May 2nd, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., we will be opening uh, another exhibition. It is going to be our thesis and departures. And uh, that is where we celebrate the student work from the uh, Daytona State College students and the UCF students that are a part of uh, our photography program. And then in, on May 11th, we will have a fantastic program presented by uh, Lorenzo and Sarah, two of our artists here. Uh, again, we will have more information uh, about that once we iron out some more details. So those are some of our exciting programming that's coming up. Uh, and I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, if people continue to roll in, they will unfortunately just have missed a few minutes of our fun. So I'd like to introduce everyone to the artists that we have with us today. We have uh, the uh, the curator of the actual exhibit and um, and also uh, an artist featured in the exhibit, Jillian Marie Browning. Uh, we also have John Wes. We have Lorenzo Trevergo and Sarah Van Dyke. We have Brittany Kathy Adams with us. We have Lorena Molina. We have Eva Berhanu, and we have Asia Lachelle. So we're really only missing a couple of the artists that we have on display as a part of this exhibition. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm going to start with Jillian. Jillian, can you start us off by telling us about your vision for this exhibition and how you selected this group of artists? Yes. All right. So. When I was approached to um, have, do an exhibition um, at the SNP, um, my thought was like, I wanted to do a group show because I felt like it was more beneficial for me to bring in people that I wanted, like that particular community in Daytona Beach and the photography students at the Daytona State, State College program to see, like, than just like a floor full of my work. I was like, nah, I'm curating something. I've never curated something before. It definitely is a labor of love. Don't know if I'll ever do it again, but this was like very <laughs> important to me. And so I was like, I'm, I'm just gonna do it. At times I was like, this is very hard. And I was like, no, it's gonna be fine. Um, and so when I went through and picked the artists for this exhibition, like literally some of these people I have known for years, some of these people I have never met ever in my life. Some people I have met once and I was like, I love the vibes of this person. Um, some people I, found their work on Instagram, just like looking through other other artists that I follow. 
uh, and like the them and you know people posting each other's work on Instagram and like seeing people and I like I will always um, sort of like write down people that I like because I also like as as a, an educator like I'm always giving my students like um, uh, contemporary artists that they can look at that relate to them and also I feel like it's very important to always be having fresh new people no matter like the level of where they are in their career to kind of show students so they can see like what what people are currently doing and working kind of in the field. And so um, when I was like finding people and going through my list of artists that I follow, people that I know, I was like, okay, so let me, what, what's the theme? I know I wanna do self-portraiture for this a particular exhibition. I'm a self-portrait artist. I feel very connected to the idea of self-portraiture, which I guess I'll go on a little bit more like later, but I was like other people who work within self-portraiture, whether it's their primary, like their primary like focus within their art, or they have maybe one or two pieces or just one project where they work with self-portraiture. Self-portraiture, but like, why are they doing that? What does it mean for them? And as I was picking people for this exhibition, um, it wasn't even like purposely picking people who were maybe like not necessarily um, like the norm, right? Like the norm that could have sort of traditional um, sort of like person. It was the idea of like who are the people who are making the most like the most interesting work that I like right now that I'm personally invested in, uh, and like why are they making that work? And then I was finding that like all the people that I were pulling were people who were making work about race, about gender, um, ab about like sexuality, about things like that. And then I started putting the connection together about like well what do I want the show to be about, and then also the area in which it's going to show like is well, how is that going to impact the people and who is going to see it and so when I was making this this like exhibition I was like all right cool no I know exactly what's going to happen I know who I want to show and why I want to show it and I will say I'm an alumni of the, of the Daytona State College photography program that program is very dear to me the, I was a work study student at the museum so again was very dear to me uh to want to have this to have this opportunity but also I was like what did I want to see when I was in school. What did mushy brained 18 year old Jillian like what would I love to see as a photography student? And I feel like if I had walked into an exhibition like this as a you know like someone who wasn't quite sure like who I was or what I wanted to be or the kind of art that I wanted to make, I feel like if I had walked into something like this and saw the variety of of types of, of photography, but also the variety of people in this exhibition, it would have really opened my eyes a lot sooner then uh, I had to like eventually sort of find people that I feel like looked like me or made work that I wanted to make. And it wasn't necessarily uh, shown to me uh, in an accessible way when I was young and in school. And so I was like, if I'm given this opportunity to, to have the show an exhibition and to make work and show people what I think is important, I'm going to go head headstrong, headlong right into that and not and not have and not think about like should I sort of try to dumb this down or censor this in a way uh and luckily Whitney was like whatever you want these people this work looks great these people look I was like thank you because I was really honestly worried um that like I would want to put together this vision for this exhibition and, and these particular pieces of work and mm -hmm. I would get some sort of pushback about that and I was really happy that that I didn't get any pushback and that people could see and experience this exhibition uh, and be able to then have conversations about that. You know, the artists that are in this are very unapologetic in the kind of work that they make and why they make it. And I thought that was a very important thing to show but also in the variety of the kind of the kinds of work. So, I mean, I primarily make uh, sort of alternative process type things. They're larger pieces. Uh, some people work with very traditional photography. Some people do other things. And, you know, we're also bringing in like Eva, who has like a tapestry, you know, like a woven piece. And I wanted to really sort of sort of question the idea of what photography could be, because that's something that I also wish that I had seen when I was an undergraduate student about like photography doesn't have to just be an image printed on a piece of paper, it can be lots of lots of different things. Uh, and I wanted to, you know, have that in there. I wanted to be able to have people see this exhibition and, and ask various levels of questions about why they're seeing what they're seeing, why the artists are making this work specifically, uh, and why is it the, the medium that it actually is. And so I really wanted to um, sort of have that uh, variety, have those questions being asked, and also uh, have people maybe uh, exposed to something that they're not normally, would not normally be exposed to sort of in an institution. Based on the feedback we've been getting from the students that have come in and class tours and, and the public, uh, what you were talking about, about 
creating an exhibit that you would have wanted to see when you were uh, an undergrad student here. I think I, I think this exhibit has already proven successful in that you have uh, excited a lot of uh, students. Uh, you all have with with uh, your work that's on display. Um, I want to kind of move into the rest of the artists and uh, hear some thoughts from you all about uh, what drew you to start working in self-portraiture and maybe, you know, was this a one-off for you or is this your bread and butter for uh, your uh, general body of work to be in self-portraiture? Yeah, and we didn't talk about an order beforehand, so feel free to jump in if you feel called to start <laughs> I'll jump in I'll start um so for <laughs> like, like I said I I am a um an alumna of the Daytona State from um, college photography program and the just the nature of that program uh does not necessarily um sort of generate um art-based photography I'll say it that way mm -hmm. um and so when I was sort of uh, like to going to that program, doing that stuff, learning so many technical things, loving that aspect of it, I didn't feel connected to the kind of work that I was making. And so when I what started to sort of experiment or think about what's the kind of artwork that I want to make, who do I want to be as an artist, and what do I want to do to continue on to that, um, I wanted to make work that was specifically about my own personal experiences. And I think that when I started trying to do that, I was trying to incorporate like other people into this thing. And then it became like, it's not really going to be true to my own personal experience or the things that I want to say if I'm trying to generalize it. And so I started using my body as a placeholder for that first. And then as I started moving through, like, who do I want to be as an artist? I just kept using my body for that. And it became a, a thing that um, like I now I now I cannot imagine not using specifically myself when I make this work, even though all yes, all this work is specifically about me. Um, a lot of it is also made to to sort of have people uh, ask questions about things also they sometimes can see themselves in that and so my body sort of yes it is my body but also become just a body or a figure within the work um and can then be people can kind of put their own selves onto that but now like at, when i first started sort of doing this work i did not think that i would always be using myself but now it's it be it's I could not, I can't not use my own body within my work now. It's a, it's a part of, of the concept. It's a part of what it is. And I do refer to myself as a self-portrait artist. Um, and so that, that's like, it becomes a very, you know, sort of, it's a part, it's a part of the art now. It's me now. Anyone else about how they, how they arrived at self-portraiture? Um, I think for me, it, was never like a moment of I'm going to do self portrait like or like it didn't feel like a big jump it just felt like the work was being called to self portraiture mm -hmm. and as I was like moving about at first I was making um I was taking pictures of people and then I was also you know getting this diagnosis of ADHD and bipolar and borderline personality disorder and like the list kind of goes on and so it felt like it was just necessary for the work. And that's kind of what draw, like, drew me towards self-portraiture. And it was through doing that, that like I was able to form even stronger connections with my audiences as they also related to like what I was talking about. Um, and so it just, I guess it never really, I don't know if I consider myself a self-portrait artist, but it just felt like where, wherever the work kind of calls is where I kind of lean into and just go towards. So. I think like when I think of future work, I'm like, well, if, it, if I need to put myself in it, then I'll do that, you know, mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of how I approached it. What about an Aaron Gordon, our previous, uh, the previous museum director has an excellent uh, follow up question. Uh, she would love to hear some of you talk about uh, the vulnerability required to uh, use yourself as the subject matter, you know, in self portraiture. Um, and uh, I would love to, to, to hear from anyone who has thoughts on that. So for me personally, um, it definitely took a lot of realizing what, but that, that the art that I'm making, and even though it's a picture of me, it is not me. 
because mm-hmm. like, especially like when you're making this work and you're in school for it, like it's just print all the time. It's critique, it's critique, it's critique. And then when you're putting up an image that is of yourself, sometimes you can sort of take that personally. It's like, someone doesn't like my art and my art is a picture of me. So that person doesn't like me. And I think that I had, it took, it took a while, it took years um, for me to realize, for me to just divorce myself from that. So yes, it's a photo, like at least for me personally, it is a photo of me, but it is my art at that point. So once it is made and it is there, it is not me anymore. So I frankly do not care if someone does not like it. Um, and cause that's not even why I'm not making it people to really like, honestly. Um, but it just also, it's just not me. Like I, I see my work and I don't say that's me. It's the art that I created. Okay, so you've kind of, you've got a, like a level of like mental removal almost. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want anyone on the spot, but uh, Brittany, I know that your artist statement deals so much with uh, exploring and kind of overcoming uh, vulnerability through your self-portraiture work. So I was wondering if you could weigh in as well. Yeah, I was just thinking, oh, the separation that Jillian has up. Oh. Can I buy that? Let me buy that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. How do you how do you trick yourself into having that? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's. I'm glad that the question was surrounding vulnerability because I think there is a level of vulnerability that does come to self portraiture. Um, but I think I think a testament to all the people in the room probably is that there's a big difference between like knowing that there's a there's a moment where you're like yeah that takes some vulnerability but I'm sure any, everyone in here can probably resonate with the fact that being told that you're brave for doing your work is something that we all just want to sort of like eye roll super hard because it's a reminder that we're not supposed to be in the art world mm-hmm. a reminder that we're the outliers to fine art photography or photography or this whole medium to be reminded that we should have to be brave to do this work um, is yeah, it's a backhanded compliment, but it's also very true that it does take vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was really interested in hearing, you know, how people came to portraiture or self portraiture, especially because for me, it was really resistant. It was like kicking and screaming to get me to turn my camera on myself because one, you have to give up that good, good feeling of looking through the lens. Um, but two, because when I first saw, uh, Laura Aguilar's work, I thought that she broke every rule that as a fat woman, I was following, like, don't be seen, be as small as possible, definitely never show nudity and never show nudity in a way that could be empowered or of beauty or of neutrality of just saying, this is my body. And so it's hard to untie that it does take vulnerability, but I do think that some of that separation that Jillian's talking about is really important. I have to put on my armor when I talk about my work, because I'm like, ah, deeply psychological, but we're not here to discuss my mental health. That's like Tuesdays with my therapist. So uh, it's, it's definitely a huge conversation. Like we all do have to take a step into saying, I'm going to use my body as a vessel for this larger conversation that we're having, knowing it's both personal and uh, global and universal in some cases. And John, I think I cut you off right as you were about to say something. No, 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 no. I was just going to, I'm so glad you cut me off because that was uh, a wonderful, wonderful kind of uh, segue uh, from what Jillian said into what Bernie said. Uh, and I, I I just resonated in a lot of those those kind of phrases and uh, ways we talk about self-portraiture as well. I think for me, there's, there's this interesting journey through the process of self-portraiture where you are um, either intimately making the image yourself by yourself alone in solitude or with a very small circle of intimate uh, connections so you either have a collaborator or somebody that's working directly with you um, and so I think it's interesting to talk about that creation of those initial steps of uh, making that image as like bravery in a way that you're not you're just doing it for you at that point point. and I think for me it's this step of I'm not thinking about what people are going to be considering when I'm making that piece. That comes later when I start to synthesize how I'm going to present the work and how I'm going to show the work. Um, And I think that bravery then comes. And for me, it's interesting because the bravery is, yeah, it's that eye roll moment where you're like, okay, sure. Is it brave for me to put my own presence on a wall in a different aspect than we're putting ourselves in social media or in every possible aspect of society everywhere else 
I don't think so. Um, but I do think it is really, really brave to intentionally think about how we're doing this and crafting and creating these, these pieces that ultimately end up transcending who we are as individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is the magic for me of self-portraiture is that I, my, a lot of my work is not me facing the camera or really me as an identifiable person. It is all me, um, but there, are, there is a, a, an ability that I sort of try to learn and bring into my work of transforming myself into something that is beyond me. Um, and I think that's personally a desire to become something more, something else. Um, again, I'll echo Brittany's, that's my Thursdays with my therapist. Um, but <laughs> but it's an innate it's an innate feeling for me that I'm not necessarily interested in making work that is um, directly my face and that's an identifiable uh, persona for me. Uh, I live in this fantasy world that is uh, very, very tied to my gender, my sexuality, <clears throat> and just wanting desperately to see more of that um, as much as possible everywhere I go. Excellent. So we might come back to uh, talking about self-portraiture. Lorena. Oh, oh yeah. yes. Thank you. Can yes. I just say something really quickly? I, yes, I think like my also, I, I think my definition of also self-portraiture is very like open and liberal about it. Like I think like if I, I'm making still life images or arrangements. So if I'm taking photographs of places I have loved and lived, like to me, those are also feel like an extension of myself and my identity. And because I'm constantly thinking about questions of belonging and creating a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. So to me, like even my, you know, landscapes or like places or still life images, to me, I see them as a extension, like a, as, as a portrait, a self portrait. And, I, and I, that to me mm -hmm. feels, really playful where like um also where like I can talk about myself and my experiences without including my body but a lot of times I do include my body because I am talking about my existence and my presence and and to different spaces and how my my body and my identity is judged within different spaces um so I think like it just depends and to me like I'm always thinking about like does it need the body does it not but I and I think I agree. Like, I think I'm I'm like with Jillian, like once I put my body is a body. <laughs> and I think like that separation allows also like a shield, like a sense of protection that for me as well, um, which I think it, I think, I think is very helpful and important when we're making work that is, you know, so much about the self and our identities. And I'd like to encourage anyone who's not reading the chat, I'm living for the chat right now. Um, Jillian, I should have warned you, Jillian must have linked Aaron all of my questions because- I did it. Aaron. <laughs> stop it, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> um so we will move right into uh Aaron's question is mine as well uh I would love to hear about you know we're we're on we're on a roll talking about how uh you all relate to self portraiture um you know and so many of you actually went into some of these bodies of work with the conscious uh, very consciously to explore parts of yourselves with the work. So I'd love to hear about how uh, or if, if and how working with self-portraiture has changed your own um, view of yourself. And was any of that surprising or expected or anything to that? I'll start if that's okay. Um, yes. I find self-portraiture to be almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, I view it as a, uh, a method and a practice of ushering in something that I want my personality, uh, my sense of self to, to conquer or tackle next. Um, I think for me, sometimes that can be anything from being a little, little more extra, being a little more gay, being a little bit more flamboyant, being a little bit more uh, brave, being a little bit more of all these different things and, and sort of practicing that with myself, practicing that intimately so that then when it gets to the wall, people do call you brave. And you're like, yeah, I did that. And that feels 
um, like its own sort of therapeutic process of actualizing yourself into the next thing. Uh, my, me working in self portraiture has made me a lot more confident as a person, really, because like who I was like when I first started making this kind of work, like I used to be a, a very shy, like not very like, you know, I mean, shy is the, I don't think is the correct term, but like, I was just not like in putting myself out there a lot. But when you, when you start making work that is of you and then putting that up and because I have sort of made this whole, this, um, this delusion that I live in where the work that I make is, is me, but like not me. Um, I'm not shy about that. So like, I will make those things. I will also, most of my imagery is nude. And so like, I make that work and I'm putting like my full naked body up in museums and stuff all the time. But like, and I tried to, this is how I try to explain this to my mother who like, doesn't really get it. But like the idea that like, I'm not gonna walk around naked, like in the street, but like, I like my naked figure that I do in my art, I will put anywhere and that's not weird to me. Like. All of my students have seen all of my work. So like all of my students have like seen most of my naked body. And like, that's not weird to me. I don't know. But like, it's like a, it's a thing of like, I've like, you know, become um, a lot more just like confident and like, I don't like the term brave, but like, you know, okay with showing myself through my, my self portraiture when I used to just be a lot more reserved and shy as a person. And I think that, that like doing this and kind of almost being forced to do it has really sort of helped me um, become more of the person that I am now and, and more confident to be able to speak about things and even um, sort of try to um, like force confidence in other people. I do that all the time. I'm like, girl, why are you not wearing that crop top? I love it. And like all of that stuff, because like I'm much more okay with who I am as a person through making this kind of work too. I know what Brittany said, honestly, about describing someone's self-portraiture work as brave will haunt me to the end of my life <laughs> because it like that has just got that is such a great point and it really is a stumbling block for anyone trying to talk about self-portraiture work that I just you know I think we have an idea of traditional self-portraiture which is just I'm pretty or you know that that's that someone just showing off their their very best and so seeing someone using self-portraiture to show vulnerable sides of themselves whether it be about like their mental health or to you know kind of show different sides of humanity um and then talking about you know what you just talked about this vulnerability it is brave to put that out into the forefront but that word brave and calling someone oh you're so brave can so so easily become a backhanded compliment i feel like you you just Brittany you've sent me down a spiral of where the English language breaks down uh, to talk about you know pathways people are treading in self portrait in contemporary self portraiture. Um, I would love to switch to some subject matter uh, talks because Lorenzo, I know. <laughs> Oh, thanks, John. Um, I wanted to. I, I'm, I'm so sorry if I start talking over you. Just plow forward because I can't see everyone when they unmute on my screen. Thank you, John. I'm sorry. I could have also. I, I, I was <laughs> my digital hand, but thanks. Yeah, I think um, one thing that um, that I that I'd love to also talk about with everyone is like the the idea of performance, and I think for me. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm using my body as a metaphor. So, you know, the project Shimmer Shimmer really started um, after um, I, I, I stopped. So I was on, um, you know, hormone therapy for 10 years. I was taking testosterone as a trans person. And um, I came to a point where I wanted to explore the idea of gender abolition. And um, I started to question what it means to pass as male all the time and have the privilege that comes along with that. And uh, what does it mean to continue to make that decision, um, you know, as a feminist and as a person, um, both personally and also in terms of my body as like a political medium, I guess. Um, and that's something, you know, Sarah and I are always talking about just um, as a queer couple that we're read all different ways, you know, sometimes as a straight couple, sometimes as like a gay guy and a fag hag, which is super problematic and misogynist in its own ways. Um, 
but kind of this frustration with passing all the time. And then um, from my prison abolition work, started to think about gender abolition. And um, the, you know, during the, the you know, the, we started this in 2020. Um, well, actually, we started doing the testing in 2019 for Shimmer mm -hmm. Shimmer. Um, but really, it was kind of this this feeling of less of like I want to use I want to do like self portraits about my, myself, um, but that I wanted to use my body as a source material, and then kind of um, through discussion and just like our lives and uh, previous creative projects, it really became apparent that it was sort of necessary for us to be working on this together because how I'm presenting to the world impacts how Sarah is read and vice versa. Um, so I stopped taking testosterone and then we started doing all these kind of test images. Um, and it really became about Sarah photographing me. So I'm, you know, performing both like these, you know, sort of um, classical, you know, uh, portrayals of how, uh, you know, Gre Greco Roman mythology would be portrayed, um, you know, like Venus here. But I'm also performing for Sarah because, you know, she's the one behind the camera. Um, and the, yeah, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Well, I feel like the, there was like a juncture in time where I always heard you describe yourself as a portrait artist, but that you hadn't done self portraiture since you were in undergrad, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, the work that you do in, this, in the studio is very formal. And so when, when we work together, um, we're generally outside and in places that are important. So. Lorena, when you were saying that it's like shooting in places and portraying places and ideas that are an element of your identity or um, that for me is resonates. And the place in particular where these are taken is a queer beach or a queer section of a beach um, in Queens in the Rockaways. And um, like, I feel like this building is my queer body and Lorenzo is portraying these uh, characters that we would ex extrapolate it from the original gendered gods and goddess pairs into the celestial bodies that were named from them and therefore um, unhitching the gendered aspects of the originals. And this, so this is, you know, not, not traditional self portraiture. Um, and in, that has been a really complicated thing to try to talk about over the last couple of years and it has like you were saying, Jillian has increased my confidence as a person to to push back against like single authorship work and single identities and bring into push myself into places that are very uncomfortable for me um, and and see myself, you know, growing as a person to be able to discuss the work and create more of it. Um, jumping off of like sort of the collaboration between um, Lorenzo and Sarah, I would love to know how you guys, when you, because it kind of like, like I think Whitney mentioned it about like um, making your work and like, do you work singularly? Do you work with other people? Like, do you invite people into your art making practice and like processing? Because like, I know for me personally, like I make all of my work by myself. Like I am, I'm everything. I don't ask another person to come and help me do anything. And if I do ask someone to help me, it's like, the actual like physical making of it. And like, I've asked like one person to do that. And it's like literally the person who has known me the longest person like in my entire life, which is Aaron. Um, and like, and that was just the, the actual like physical helping me like put the big piece of plexi on top of the, the work because I couldn't lift it up myself. We do sort of sometimes talk, like, um, I'll like run, I, I bounce ideas off of her and we kind of conceptualize some stuff together. But like, when it comes to like making of the work I do and in the photograph thing, I don't invite anybody into that for my for me and so like how do you guys do that like do you work with other people are you okay with bringing other people into your art making practice like how does that how does that work for you i think the, the first time that other people joined us for for this was a couple of weeks ago when a studio that we were working with wanted to film us shooting at the beach and talking about our process together and it was so different because we usually are shooting on the beach in the winter when it's not super crowded with beautiful people just trying to have a good time so we're like let's not um impinge on anyone's ability to feel free there um and so like having that the the you know several videographers and yeah like, but that are now have become good friends i was like well, 
this is thrilling and different, but yeah. it yeah. has it, it's so different because it's usually us like t lugging tons and tons of gear out to the you know middle of the beach that's way far down off the boardwalk. And um, th but there was a a big shift when when you brought me into some projects that you started to do or yeah. yeah. And we were basically like, okay, how can we do this? How can our family afford this? Well, on a shoestring budget, so everybody's involved, and we're, you know, going to make it happen, no matter what needs, you know, no matter what. Yep. I also, um, it was also the the um, they ended up making a thirty minute like short doc on our process, and it's been so helpful because people are like, well, how are you collaborating? And it it it's great because they were just able to kind of document us and it's, it's really very much like sharing the camera back and forth looking at framing okay you stand there let me look and then i'll stand there um so like everything from the framing um down to like what is you know the the significance of you know the background or the what are the what's the visual um language that we're you know working with here and, and things like that so um you know there are times when we show in the work and we you know get the question but like who's the artist you know and it's like um, so having this, um, yeah, so so mad is the gallery that um, gallery and studio that put it together. And it's just been so useful to be able to show how we do it because it is kind of hard to explain. And, and um, I think, um, yeah, for yeah, in the capitalist culture we live in, I think that for market driven reasons, the single authorship kind of um, is a mythology that gets like reproduced and reproduced. And so it is kind of fun to like intervene on that angle too. Mm -hmm. I think like also like when you make works like that are by yourself or including yourself is such a like intimate experience. And I think it's like, and also like thinking about historically what the camera has repre like represented and continue to represent as a tool of like an imperialism colonization and it's, it has been used as such a battling tool. Like it's so important for me to sort of be in charge of the camera. And it is awkward, like, you know, like, it's like a lot of me like running, recording, hoping, praying to God that it's in focus. <laughs> and then like, and a lot of times I'm doing these really uncomfortable things and then I get very upset because they're not in focus. And I was like, this is, <laughs> but um, but I, I think like it's, it's, it's a performance, but it's a performance where I'm, it's just like for myself and then the camera and that feels so intimate. And it's like a bubble that I want to protect and care for. And if I include somebody else, and the shoot is somebody that I like fully trust and that I feel like they also have that love and care for me. And um, so I, I, yeah, I, I like that question. So thinking about like who is in the space when you're making this work and like, and how do you allow people to be part of the work or be there? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm gonna jump in too, cause I think, <clears throat> I think it's really fascinating the everybody's different kind of uh, processes are, are really, widely unique. Um, and I think for me, when I first started, I was very much doing everything through the entire process myself, uh, totally alone, totally uh, up until essentially the work that's in this museum. Uh, and that that one of the last pieces in my in this, this, this show was actually when I started to open up um, my practice and in sort of piggybacking on those kind of ideas that Lorenzo kind of brought up uh, and Sarah just like uh, deconstructing some of the things that I had held so closely as an idea of what I think should be. So uh, I think traditionally the idea of self-portraiture meant for me that it had to be me um, and it had to be uh, this process that was just solely created uh, by me, for me, of me. Um, and then I think throughout my, my journey, I've started to really kind of think about, okay, well, if I start to deconstruct myself and my gender and my identity, how can I deconstruct those ideas of this capitalist idea that it's expensive to do this stuff? It's expensive and accessibility is, is a huge issue that my community, and I would say that most everybody that's involved in this show experiences on, on multiple levels. Um, and so I think as I, as I look at the, the trajectory and the future of what my, my work uh, is heading towards and what I want it to be, it does have to deconstruct that idea of, well, how can we take this idea of self-portraiture and how can I include the community that's around me and how can I include the, the, the people that are supporting me and also lifting us all communally together towards the same sort of pursuit. 
First of all, I just I, we haven't heard from you, Eva, and I don't want to take up much more space. Um, so um, I'm just going to put that out there. I'm going to say one quick thing, but just in regards to what John just said, just reminds me of um, like one method for that was um, when uh, Paul and Pagi Sapuya, when when they were in the Whitney Biennial, all of the um, the all the credits for the images were Paul and whoever was in the image that Paul was photographing. So it was, they were all um, credited as you know collaborations. It was really um, powerful, I thought. I love that we've had a chance to talk about what is self-portraiture and can it be done with a pair of people or a group of people instead of just one-on-one -on -one? because that's uh Lorenzo and Sarah y'all's work has created a lot of conversation like that in the gallery uh John yes you had your hand up yeah I just I just um kind of wanted to tie something into and I do really want to hear from Ava as well because I haven't heard um but but I think I just looked at the comments too and uh Aaron brought up this comment of inherently political like the personal becoming really inherently political and and I think that ties into sort of what we're all talking about right now um mm -hmm. about uh the practice of photography is so we've I think collectively in a lot of ways and not all of us personally but in a lot of ways I think it might resonate that collectively we've assumed that this practice this process of photography is a really solitary practice um you're you're often like kind of led to believe that you're this person with the camera and that's kind of up to you and that's kind of it uh and i think that ties for me of like just really deconstructing that and saying no this is something that is um very inherently tied to the people that are you are photographing the people that help you the people that you help uh and and what that means politically in this space of work too is just very much that we're all taking taking up space we're all very much allowing ourselves and our bodies to become a statement for a piece of what we are it's not the, the entire picture by any means but it's it's very it, it is something i think about all the time as just if i'm putting my presence up it does mean that my existence stands for something and that that is important for people to see in representation and um and, and just a means of I, I think about my work as like it's a lifeline. Jillian brought it up from the one of the first things she said was that, you know, if I also was an alumni of the DSC program and Southeast Museum of Photography, I worked at the museum as well. If I had seen this work, I think it would have accelerated my track and my process by like half of it. And I'm not, I, there's, that's not something I'm, I feel like I've missed out on, but just as the sort of courage and the sort of, um, inspiration to continue to say that no this work that we're all creating is desperately important because we don't know who's looking at it and we don't know what that means for them and building on what we came before us is so important and i could continue on about that too but i'm, I'm gonna let before we continue with our discussion, I want to remind all our participants that if you have a burning question that you've not typed into the chat now, now is the time to get it in the chat uh, so I can get it to our artists. Um, I did want to ask, uh, and this also kind of jumps off of Aaron's question about um, you know, your personal bodies becoming inherently political when you start using your likeness and self-portraiture and uh, some of the themes that many of you all are tackling in here, uh, especially uh, those of you who are uh, dealing with race uh, in your work. Uh, I wanted to talk to you all about, um, you know, uh, obviously this is a very important and powerful subject and uh, we all understand the general gist, but I was wondering if anyone would like to delve a little bit deeper about what you are specifically focusing on in your work. And um, I would love to do a little bit of comparing and contrasting uh, uh, against, um, you know, similarities you've seen in some of the artists here that you feel are is also present in your work and maybe some areas where you're like, I feel, I feel like we're diverging and telling uh, different chapters of the same story. Um, I could jump in now. Sorry, I've been quiet. I'm much more of like a listener than a speaker. So I've just okay. um, kind of been taking in what everyone's been speaking about. Um, but in terms of this question, um, 
I feel like I can talk a little bit more about this because I wouldn't, I don't really view myself as like a, a photographer or a self-portrait artist in general. Uh, this is like one of the only works I've ever made that is like presently me. Um, but yeah, so I'm generally, a, I'm a weaver and this is made on a jacquard loom. Uh, and yeah, like this is, this is a piece that's like diving into uh, working through my own identity and especially uh, in terms of like where I'm located, I'm, like located in a very um, <laughs> kind of like conservative town in, in Canada and uh, specifically the, the art school that I went to was uh, not diverse. I think we had like a total of like maybe three BIPOC uh, faculty members mm -hmm. uh, of which I never like experienced. So it's just like, yeah, I think like when I was making this work, which I made in school, um, I was like thinking a lot about like how I feel like I can fit in to uh, like where where I'm situated and um, I was like working through kind of like maybe like funny ways of like viewing my identity and a lot of that I was like diving into my hair uh, and I, so I essentially one day just like woke up boiled some ramen noodles threw them on my head um, took a photo of myself and then like the next week I just like wove it and it's just it was kind of like a cathartic thing for me, um, but I will say also like after making this work, I've like taken a big step back from like diving into this kind of like work where I'm like actually present uh, in what I'm making because it's just like very vulnerable. It's very uh, open to like criticism and like comments that you don't necessarily want. And so I've kind of like taken a step back from that and like I'm evaluating now what self-portraiture is in my work because I do think every every kind of art is in a sense self-portraiture because you're always like, you know, involving your own experiences uh, and your own, um, I don't know, like you're just always inviting, uh, inviting yourself into your work. Uh, so I do think that I'm still kind of working through a similar lens, but I'm not like necessarily like involving my actual like face or body or anything in my work now. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that kind of answers some of that question. No, that's lovely. Thank you. Would anyone else like to chime in or jump off of what Eva well, was talking about? I wanted to just quickly, Sarah just asked a question about um, yeah. where work um, takes up space or where does it exist in. Um, and I'm going back to what Eva just talked about. Like I went, and this changes for me all the time. Like I, um, when I was in grad school, I went to University of Minnesota and it was just extremely white program. And, and that has been the case for me for the past 10 years. Um, now I live in Houston and so my world has, has completely has changed. It's like, I'm loving it. But, uh, but I, I was, con when I was in grad school, it was this experience of constantly feeling other or satisfied or just constantly feeling like single mm -hmm. out. Like my presence was always known. Like whenever I went to a gallery, when I went to museum or when the classroom, like my presence was so clear because I was like the only one in this whole room. And at the time I was just so like angry. And, and I was like, if you're gonna other me in these spaces and my presence gonna become a confrontation. Like I am here to make you uncomfortable. I'm here to make you aware of like your role in society and um, and like this power dynamics. And, and so like a lot of my work was like, you know, like people had to like choose to actively participate in it. And as a, in, the, in, in a way they're implicating themselves in the actions. So for a long time, I was making work from that place. Like that was confrontational. And I'm just like, I'm here to fuck you up. <laughs> like, you know, like, and, uh, but then I, you know, something changed. And um, during the pandemic, where I was making a lot of work that is talking about these really difficult histories of like genocide and like war crimes and all those things that are very much part of my experience and my identity. 
and it was taking such a toll on me. And I, I started to think of other ways of making work and thinking and I, and then I started thinking about like who am I making work for to me if I'm making work that is confrontational I and or like this talking about difficult histories is a way to educate others to me it felt like I was making work for white people and I <laughs> so then and that was exhausting so I started to really make images that feel like more tender and that are playful and that are like talking about beauty and slowness and care and um and I, and like even work that feels more healing for myself and for like the communities that I'm making work for. So I think like a lot of it has shift, but I, I am constantly thinking like, where am I showing the work? What is my identity? What does it carry? What is the weight that my identity carries in this space? Um, and, um, and like, what do I bring to it? And I think, and because I cannot, there's a few things like I can separate separate myself from the institutions that I'm part of, mm -hmm. but just like the same way that I can't separate my race, you know, from all the work that I that I make or how I view the world, how people see me, like const like all my work is constantly racialized because I, <laughs> I know I mm -hmm. I'm 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 seen from that viewpoint, but also I see my world within that racialized like, you know, um experience because so it's just complicated. Like, I think like there's different parts where you're constantly like navigating the politics of the space and how do you present the work and what work do you present and, and, and so on. I'll jump in quickly and kind of bounce off of, of what was just said, but like, yeah, the idea that like, no matter uh, kind of like what the work is about, if my, if I'm in it or, or how I look in it or what it is, it's always going to be about blackness or uh, about queerness or about having a femme body or about this kind of stuff because it's a picture of me and when I was in grad school that was a big thing that I was dealing with because I was making this work that I felt was not general in a sense of like uh every it was waiting to everyone it was general in a sense of these are my experiences so I'm not making this work specifically about something just something that I went through and then I would have faculty who would refused to un try to understand it because they didn't get it even though i was like oh this is a thing that i feel like everyone can get but there would be a wall because they felt like that they did not um resonate with it exactly the way in which i did so then i started to think about well why am i making this work and who am i making it for and like that also was a big part of of me continuing to be a self-portrait artist um but also uh the honestly building confidence of what was me basically being like um, I'm making this for people who uh, will understand it. And if you don't understand it, it's not my job to teach anything to you about it. And um, you should, you can take it for what it is, or if you do get it, then that's wonderful. And the people who do get it, get it. And those are the people who I'm making that work for. That reminds me of Asia's comment at our opening when she was talking about uh, her, uh, uh, it's a, the, the projection owed to Gordon mm -hmm. and how many times you went, you encountered people who were not familiar with the historic photograph to then understand the deeper meanings and just that, that, that creates this position, like, like what, what you were saying, Jillian about, you know, what do you deal with that? Do you then take that as an opportunity to, uh, okay, well, here's the education opportunity or, you know, the the other side of that coin being like, you know, it is not my job to make sure you have a general understanding of art history. Yeah, that, definitely. Thanks for bringing that up. I think that when it came to like Ota Gordon and um, using other poses from like historical Black imagery, um, that was like a it was a big decision to make, you know, because I, it, some of them aren't recognizable at like, well, I think right away recognizable by certain um, people. And so when I was making this work, um, just thinking about how I wanted to be represented or how much I wanted to educate has been like just a huge, I don't even like almost a dilemma that I've been going, that I've been dealing with. It's like thinking about getting the white gaze off of my shoulders. I think it's something like Toni Morrison was talking about. Um, and how that white gaze kind of just like, is just there, right? And it's like, when I'm making work, it's been so much for like Lorena was saying, like education purposes sometimes, or to make my voice heard. Because at like, when I, I went to Michigan State, 
And that was extremely white. And I always felt like my voice was just somewhere hidden in all this like chaos. And so I would make work that would be like gut punching, but it would also be like really educating and it would be really heavy on me when creating that work because it was like, this isn't really what I want to do, but I feel like that's the only way that I can get my voice heard is if I use like a shock value. Um, and so it took a while for me to get to a place to just make work. And I'm still working on that. Um, that's just for me. And, you know, just thinking about what I, how I want to be seen. Um, and race in particular plays such a huge role in that. Um, especially in this body of work, being Black and queer and with all these mental illnesses and growing up in spaces where it's like mental illness isn't talked about or, you know, like you hear people who had ADHD and they just got like whoopings or something like that. Like, you know, like and it's it's the way it's processed or talked about um, within like the Black community. And so I wanted to really, like, I wanted to make this work not just educational, but also make it so it's not taboo to talk about, um, that it's not weird to talk about like mental illness and things like that, um, especially taking medication for it, you know, and being someone, you know, a black woman being presented with these mental illnesses and taking medication for it and how I'm always met with um, kind of like, yeah, I guess judgment for that decision. Um, and so through making this work, I really just want to explain or uh, just express, you know, like, let's normalize this or let's talk about this more, or add to the conversation um, about it. Yeah, I think, too, in my work, it's it's really not lost on me that, uh, you know, the very existence of my presence as a white gay man is literally built on the backs of trans people of color. Uh, and and that whole concept and notion is is something that I am am thinking about constantly. Of okay, how am I how am I able to talk about gender and sexuality without talking about my whiteness uh, and my complicity? Um, and I think that is something really integral to the conversation of um, I think the the queer community right now specifically. It feels like there is this divide of the sort of cis white gay and then the rest of the community. Um, and I think that that is really, really important to me. Um, and I, I think I was thinking about that a lot as I was making um, one of these images in this piece where I'm uh, presenting as a demon at the table with a cigarette. Um, and, and just like the thought of um, how that was built and perpetuated on the back of racism, of uh, religion and capitalism. Um, and, and really in a place of um, navigating that in self-portraiture, which I think Asia really talks about really quite well when it, it's that line of how do we figure out how to deconstruct this outside of shock value as well. Um, and I think that we are so, in such a, a wild world of media and representation and just imagery in general that it is difficult to not do the sort of Barbara Kruger ap approach, right? Where you just like, you're you're thrusting somebody into a room and you're saying everything you want of them, but you're plastering it on the wall in red letters, you know? Um, and so I think that I don't have necessarily a greater point than that, but I just think it's really important that um, that conversation is not just also, um, that, that white people are also in this conversation of deconstruction. And I know we're running up against our scheduled time, but I want to throw it to Lorenzo real quick. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to jump off of what John was saying and what actually um, everyone, like Lorena and Asia, like this, this conversation of um, how much of it is, is shock value or kind of pushing back. But um, before Shimmer Shimmer, we did, Sarah and I did a project called Monumental Resistance Stonewall, where um, I stood in front of the Stonewall Inn for 24 hours. And um, I was topless and uh, I was just wearing shorts. So I was, you know, not wearing shoes. And um, Sarah created like 3,500 images uh, over the course of 25, uh, 24 mm -hmm. hours. But um, the whole point was to kind of be um, like, use my body um, as um, an homage to the um, trans people of color who, um, who, who started our fight and who are still not uh, gaining any of the benefits. Um, and are attacked. 
daily in our legislature across the country. Yeah, and so um, it kind of just circles back to vulnerability. Um, I guess part of the idea was like to offer my body up and to offer that sort of res resistance uh, uh, by way of standing, you know, re like resisting uh, fatigue. Like also we're talking about re resistance fatigue and resisting that, but anyway, but yeah, kind of offering my body up um, and making it vulnerable um, by way of like, in order to try to pay that, um, that homage. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So we are at uh, two o'clock in one minute, at least here in Daytona, two minutes, excuse me. <laughs> um, I want to keep chatting. I just want to sit here and continue to talk. <laughs> but I know that some of our artists may have things uh, that they have scheduled. Some of our attendees uh, may not be able to stay on much longer. So I was going to go ahead and wrap it up. I wanted to ask if anyone had any final comments uh, before we uh, tune off for the day. I have to run to, uh, but I was just going to say, uh, I'm going to put my Instagram again in the chat, but if you want to DM, I'm sure all of us would be welcome to have that conversation continue as like personal channels. Yes. I didn't want to jump in and just kind of say that I am so deeply appreciative of every single artist who agreed to be in this exhibition. Um, like I said, like when I, I wanted to make something that was really special to me, and even if no one else liked it, I, I love this exhibition and I love all of the artists that are in it. I love all of the work that you guys create and who you are as people. And so like, again, I'm just extremely appreciative that you agreed to, to do this with me. And so I just, I love you guys. Yes, thank you all so much. Okay, every uh, everyone, we're getting lots of loves in the love love in the chat coming through as well. <laughs> it was such a gift to be with you all and to see your work as well. So thank you so much. Um, wonderful to share space with you. Yeah, and especially with uh, an exhibition that is pulling artists from so far away across the country and out of the country, this has been a joy to work with you all for this virtual program and get to uh, meet a lot of the artists that weren't going to be able to come here in person. So thank you all for participating in this. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting us. Absolutely. Okay, we are going to go ahead and uh, log off and say goodbye. Uh, we did record this session, so uh, we will do some uh, we will do some brushing up of the recording, and we will get that out. So if you have a friend or you know someone who wasn't able to join us and would like to listen in our on our conversation, it is saved for posterity. Uh, thank you all.